in teaching a course last month at Oregon Bible College in Illinois, I was impressed anew with the picture that those Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, especially as I was teaching those, but John also, give us of Jesus as the master teacher. This picture of him emerges many, many times as we look in the Gospels and see the Savior as he spoke to the multitudes that thronged about him day after day, bringing forth the words of life, the incomparable teachings of eternal life from our Savior. I'd like to turn, first of all, this morning to the Gospel of Matthew, the first of our Gospels in our New Testament. For Matthew particularly stresses this, however, he doesn't have any exclusive uh, picture as far as that goes, but he does stress that picture of Jesus. Turning to the fourth uh, chapter of the Gospel, we notice in verse 23 that as Jesus is presented in the beginning of his ministry as he goes forth following the selection of some of his original disciples, it says that Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Here we see Jesus in a threefold work. First of all, he mentions that he was teaching, and then preaching, and then healing. All of these things, of course, went on pretty much simultaneously in his ministry. And yet it's interesting that the thing that Matthew mentions first here is that he was teaching, teaching the people of Israel. If you cast your eye just a little further down the page, in the fifth chapter, we have the beginning of the famous Sermon on the Mount, which all of us are quite familiar with, I'm sure. The first two verses picture Jesus in this way. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. In this description, we have two interesting words that I would like to call your, to your attention. First of all, the, the word taught, in verse 2, speaks of him as teaching them, and then come the teachings following that, beginning with the world-famous Beatitudes, some of Jesus' most beautiful and renowned words. He taught them. But in order for anyone to be taught, that person must be willing to learn. There's a two-way street involved person could stand up and teach as far as saying words for all day long. But unless those words are listened to and acted upon, no teaching is really taking place. It's a two-way street. In verse 1, we have the word disciples. His disciples came unto him. This is the other side of the process. The word disciple in the original language means a learner, a student, a pupil, a follower of a teacher. That's the original meaning of this word. Here were some people who were gathered about Jesus who had decided that they would learn from Jesus that they would listen to him, that they would accept him as their teacher, that his words would be lessons for them. 
And so they are described as his disciples, his learners. Now at first, that group of learners must have been quite small. In fact, we usually think of the 12 as his disciples. There were more than that, of course. It speaks later of the 70 that he sent out. And there are implications that there were many more than that, even during his earthly ministry. Those who were counted as students of Jesus, of his teachings, learning the lessons that he had gone about to teach. Later on in his ministry, Jesus issues a very gracious invitation to many more people. As recorded in Matthew, the 11th chapter, verses 28 through 30. Up to this time now, he's been going about Galilee and other parts of Palestine, teaching, preaching, healing. Enough people now have been exposed to him as a teacher to have some recognition of what he stands for. And so one day we read that he says to those multitudes gathered around, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here Jesus is inviting people to become his students, his learners. He's saying, come to me, learn of me. Let me be the one who teaches you. Listen to what I have to say. He's inviting people in a very definite way to become his followers, his learners. The word yoke is an interesting word. Those of you who have perhaps seen a yoke of oxen or some other animals yoked together to pull a wagon, to pull a plow, or to do work of that nature, have seen how those animals are expected to work together. We don't see much of that anymore in our country with the tractors and modern farm equipment that people have. Down in Mexico, we still see some yokes of oxen. I can remember, and I have a, Phyllis took a picture of a beautiful yoke of oxen down in Mexico. I don't know if you've ever seen our picture of that. Standing there, and the man was working with the oxen. They were yoked together. This must have been a common scene in the days of Jesus' earthly ministry. Jesus is saying, Take my yoke upon your shoulders. The implication, it seems to me, is that he wants to share the yoke. He doesn't expect us to pull the yoke alone. He's going to pull it with us, next to us, alongside of us, if we will but listen to his teachings. In those days, it was a common expression among the Jews that the law of God given through Moses was a yoke. The Jews spoke of this as the yoke of the law. In fact, whenever a Gentile person decided to follow and obey and serve the, the God of Israel and accept the Jewish faith, that person was said to take upon himself the yoke of the law. And in the Jewish practice, as was given in the Old Testament, 
that person would have to be circumcised, who was a man, to accept the yoke of the law, or and or be baptized. Of course, they baptized, and by the way, the Jews did practice baptism, it was very interesting. We think of that as something that was introduced by John the Baptist. That is not the case. The Jews baptized Gentile converts along with circumcising male converts to the Jewish faith. These were called proselytes or converts to the Jewish faith. In Acts, the 15th chapter, we have a very interesting picture because in the early church, there were those who wanted the Gentile believers, those who had accepted the gospel, to become Jews, to be circumcised, to accept the law of Moses with all of its regulations. Verse 5 tells us, there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them, that is the Gentile believers, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. They must keep the law, said these people. And so a gathering of the apostles was made to decide this question with God's help through the direction and leadership of God's spirit. One of the things that was said here in verse 10 by the apostle Peter he says, well, let's read verse 9 also. He says that God put no difference between us, us Jewish believers, and them, the Gentile believers, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, the Gentile disciples? which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Peter says, why do you want to put the yoke of the law on these people who have already accepted the yoke of Jesus, have begun to learn of Jesus, who have received his yoke? Why put the additional yoke upon them of the law? A double burden, which Peter says, neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. We Jews could hardly bear the yoke of the law. Why do you insist upon putting it on the Gentiles as well? And of course, the decision was made, as you read on in the chapter, as the Spirit of God led these apostles and leaders in Jerusalem, not to put the yoke of the law upon the Gentile believers. Yesterday in our study down at Ephrata, we've been studying the book of Galatians, which is sometimes called the Charter of Christian Liberty. The fifth chapter of that book, in the first verse, Paul writes to the church at Galatia, which was being told by some that they must take and keep the law of Moses. Paul writes to them, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't put the yoke of the law upon yourselves. You already have the yoke of Christ. That's enough. And that yoke, he says, involves liberty, freedom, spiritual freedom, the freedom that with which Christ, he says, has made us free. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. It's not like the law. The law said, do this, or don't do that. But it gave no power 
either to do what it said or to avoid doing what it said not to do. The yoke of the law had in itself no power to help us. But Christ promised when he gave us his yoke that he would be with us, that his power and his spirit would be with us. Jesus said, Lo, I am with you all the days, even unto the consummation of the age. And he says, I will send you another helper, even the Holy Spirit of God, to be with you, to work within your lives, to lead you, to strengthen you. There was no promise like that in the law, that the law would give you the power to keep it. In fact, that very verse that I just quoted in Matthew 28, in which Jesus had said, had promised that he would be with us. He also extended this teaching ministry and obligation and responsibility to his disciples throughout the world. I'd like you to turn to Matthew 28. Beginning in verse 18, we read that he said to his apostles, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach, that is, make disciples of or believers of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Teaching them, that is, those who have accepted, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, or the end of the age. Those who are brought to the gospel of Christ, who obey that gospel, who repent of their sins, who are baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of their sins, he says, are to be taught further to observe all things that Jesus commanded his disciples, his apostles, to carry on those things that Jesus had taught them. He had said to the disciples that when the Holy Spirit comes, you will be brought to remembrance of all things that I have taught you. Whatever I have said, you will remember those things. It would have been hard in their strength alone to remember everything Jesus had said during those three and a half years he was with them. How do we know our Gospels are an accurate account of all those things Jesus did and said? When we had our studies of the Gospels at the, in our college course last month, we talked about the various things that tend to show us that we have a very accurate and trustworthy account of what Jesus did and said. Added to that, we know that God's Spirit worked in these disciples so that they might write for us a history in those Gospels, a historical account of what Jesus did and said. And so we have those teachings which he says are to be passed on all the way down to the end of the age to his followers. One generation passing them on to another. It's interesting that when the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, he, care, he mentions this very thing. In 2 Timothy 2, he's writing to Timothy and he says, You, Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Notice verse 2. The things that you, Timothy, have heard from me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I want you to notice that chain. There are four links in the chain. First of all, he says, 
Timothy, you learned from me. I was the first link for you. I taught you the gospel. Then he says, I want you as the next link to pass it on to faithful men, the third link. Faithful men who in turn, he says, shall be able to teach others also. There's your fourth link. Paul, Timothy, the ones Timothy teaches, and they in turn teach others. The implication is that it's to go on and on and on, generation after generation, passing on down the faithful teachings that Jesus had, in fact, as the first link, earlier than Paul, imparted to him. And to make sure that we do it, we have this. Not simply oral transmission. The problem with simply oral transmission is that it tends after a while to become garbled. Some of you play, have played that game called telephone, where you sit around in a circle, and someone starts a saying, just any saying at all, and whispers it, into the ear of the person next to him. And that person, in turn, whispers it into the ear of the next person. And so it goes around the circle, and then the last person has to say what he heard. And usually it comes out quite garbled from what the first person said. And so what we have, then, is this written word that God has seen to it that has been ca carried on down generation after generation, to ensure that the spoken word will not become too estranged and too different from what we read right here. I'd like to turn with you to our scripture lesson, which we read from John, the eighth chapter this morning. We have some very interesting things said here by Jesus to the Jewish people. He had told them that they were going to lift him up. This, of course, was a reference to his crucifixion, to his death. Verse 28, he says, When you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am he, that I am the Son of Man, that that's who I am. This is a term for the Messiah, the Son of Man. You'll find this in Daniel's book, chapter 7. The Son of Man is the promised Messiah. I am He. You're going to find this also in verse 58. Before Abraham was, I am. I am He. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of Man. It's also in verse 24. I said, therefore, unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am, King James adds he, that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. I am. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of Man. I am he. I am the promised one. These are all titles for the promised king, the anointed one of Israel. But let's go on. You notice he says, as the Father has taught me, so I speak these things. Again, we have a chain. God begins the, the chain. The Father has taught me. Now I'm teaching you, he says. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. Now notice verse 30. This is very important. As he spake these words, many believed on him. The, the New International says that many of them put their faith in him at that moment. While Jesus was actually saying these particular words, 
some of those Jews standing by decided this really is the Messiah. This really is the one that he claims to be. And they put their faith in him at that very moment. They believed that he indeed was the one whom he claimed to be, namely the Son of Man. However, Jesus didn't stop there. I want you to notice this. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. How did he know they believed on him? Here's a teacher standing before a group of students or an audience. How does he know what they're thinking at that moment? I certainly don't know what you this morning are thinking at this moment as I speak to you. Ah, but I'm not Jesus. I do not have the knowledge that Jesus had. Jesus knew what people were thinking while they were thinking it. We have many examples of that in the Gospels where Jesus, it says, read their hearts. He knew their hearts. He read their minds. He knew what people were thinking. At this moment, Jesus knew that these Jews had put their trust in him. Notice what he said to these Jews, these particular ones. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. This is crucial. If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. That's the title of my message this morning. Disciples indeed. Now it's very easy to say I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I've been born again, some say, or I've been saved. Very, very easy to say that. Many people say it. But Jesus says... It's not enough to simply believe on him at one point. He says that you must continue in my word. And he says, if you do, then you're really my disciples. Then you are really my followers. The NIV says, if you hold to my teaching. Not simply if you continue in my word, but if you hold to my teaching, then you're really my disciples. There's no higher privilege on earth than to be a disciple of Jesus. One who follows him, learns of him, and obeys him. No higher privilege on this earth than that. Going back a little earlier in John's Gospel, the third chapter and the 35th and 36th verses, I'd like to call your attention to something that sometimes we don't see because we may not compare, and I recommend to all those who are Bible students, and I think all of us should be, if we're going to do what Jesus says here, continue in his word. We need to compare with our modern translations of the Bible. Now, I love the King James as much as any of you do. That's why I use it in the pulpit most of the time. But we have some other translations that are very helpful. We don't speak the way they spoke in 1611. Our language has changed considerably in 300 and some odd years. So I recommend that we use other translations to compare. Keep on using your King James, but get other ones and study them as well because they cast further light on what the scripture writers are saying and writing for us. I'd like to read verses 35 and 36 in our King James, but notice another rendering which the New American Standard has. 
Jesus says, The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Verse 36, where it says, He that believeth not the Son, the original says, and the NASB says, He that does not obey the Son, Son of God, shall not see life. Again, they stress on obedience, continuing in the word that Jesus gave us. There in John 8, so many times we hear people, people quoting verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Now quote it out of context. People use that even in political speeches sometimes or social reform messages of one kind or another. You'll know the truth. The truth shall make you free. But I believe that promise was made in a special context here. And we're not free to use that out of context. Jesus is talking to those who continue in his word. Or as we notice, the NIV said, you hold to my teachings. Then he says, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That promise is made to disciples indeed, to those who really become followers of Jesus and his teachings, and obey his teachings. Then he says, you will know the truth, and the truth will indeed make you free. While we're in John's Gospel, let's look at the 14th chapter for a minute. Verse 15. Jesus is talking here to his inner circle now of disciples shortly before his death. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, you disciples of mine, who have been learning of me, who have been listening to me all this time, says, if you really love me, do what I say. Keep my commandments. Or as it says in Luke, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Verse 21, he says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. It's not enough to just have them. He says you've got to keep them. You've got to obey them. He says those are the people who love me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas says to him, not Iscariot, the other Judas, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Again, the stress that it all goes back to the Father, Jesus says. It's not mine. I didn't originate it. I am simply passing on to you, says Jesus, what my Father passed on to me. And he says, if you love me, then you're going to keep my words, words which the Father has given me to give to you. In chapter 15, verse 14, he says, You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. He wants us to be more than simply his learners or his servants or his followers. He wants us to be friends. An intimate relationship of friendship, of trust, of love, of understanding one to another. Is Jesus your friend? 
Do you feel that you are Jesus' friend? He says, you are my friends if you do what I've commanded you to do. If you do what I've asked you to do, if you are obeying me, then you're my friends. This evening, I'd like to speak a little bit more about some of the implications of this, as well as talk about some of the things that were left over from last week. Some of those things are related. Let's consider this fact of disciples indeed. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. When Jesus comes, will he be able to say to you and to me, you are my disciples indeed.